Hello, everybody. Uh, happy Friday. Welcome to our final event of the 2022 Island Feminism Speaker Series. My name is Dr. Noralis Rodriguez Cos, and it is an honor to be your host for this panel. I want to begin this event by recognizing the traditional homelands of the Spokane, Coeur d'Alene, and Kalispell Indigenous people original communities from the place where this presentation is physically hosted in Spokane, Washington. For those of you that are joining the series for the first time, this is a space for scholars and activists um, working in island and feminist studies to spark collaboration and interdisciplinary dialogue on social justice for islands and islanders. I want to also thank our attendees that are connected from different parts of the world and those that have contributed to this event, especially my collaborator of this in this project, Dr. Marina Carides from University of, of Univer <laughs> University of Hawaii at Manoa, who is present here today. I want to emphasize that these presentations that we will watch today are uh, and that we'll hear today are tied to a forthcoming theme section on island feminisms, place justice of, and movement in the journal SHIMA, the International Journal of Research into Island Cultures. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start presenting our speakers because we have three speakers today uh, for the presentation, for the first presentation that we will um, listen is a uh, title, uh, Submergent Ea, Diasporizing Hawaiian Indigeneity. Um, one of our speakers uh, for these presentations is Mahea Lani Ahia uh, is a Los Angeles born Ka Kanaka Oi, Oi artist, scholar, activist, sun catcher, and study keeper with lineal ties to Maui, with a background in theater arts, writing, and performance from UC Berkeley and UC Irvine. Mahea is committed to creating artistic and academic projects that empower indigenous feminist decolonial research. Uh, as a U.S. Manoa PhD student in English, her dissertation research, Kihawahine, Shape-Shifting Life and Afterlife of Maui's Most Famous Akuamo, inundates biographies, gender boundaries, as it, it theorizes feminist power and leadership within the Hawaiian reptilian water deity clan. Mahea is also pursuing a graduate certificate in the Departments of Women's and Gender and Sexuality Studies, where she teaches island and indigenous feminisms, health, and LGBTQ plus studies. She serves as an editor for Hawaii Review of OWI, a native Hawaiian journal. Firstly committed to her Hawaiian community, Mahea is a founding member of the Free Access Pool Hulu, Hulu University at Manua Kea, where she helped create the Hale Mauna Wahine and co-organized the Mauna Kea Syllabus Project. And we also have Kahala Johnson, is a PhD candidate in Indigenous Politics and Future Studies with a graduate certificate in Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University of Hawaii Manoa. The research focuses on gender queer and political colonial love. Kahala is from Nawai, e Eha, Maui, and calls themselves Ahinakia Imauna for Maleakala. Kahala also resided for eight months on Mauna Kea as a protector and served as a founding member and coordinator for Puhulu Luhulu University, as well as consider uh, as co-founder and kahu or caretaker of the Hale Mauna Mahu, which they recounted in the Native Stories podcast interview series. They are a Fulbright scholar, science fiction writer, and sign artist. Their dissertation, A Nice Slippery with Echoes, examines the colonialized futures of the Hawaiian uh, kingdom. Now we also have the presentation, The Opacity of Desire, Queerness, Postcolonialism, and Diasporic Belonging in Guadalupe. Born and raised in Southern France, Ariel Daven, uh, who uses a uh, gender pronouns he, his, received a master's in anthropology and sociology from the EHESS and Sciences Po Paris. 
and is currently a PhD candidate in American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. His research focuses on the effective and corporeal everyday practices of post-colonial resistance in the Caribbean diasporic context. After finishing his first ethnographic project that discussed queer life and migration in Guadalupe and France, his current dissertation project tentatively entitled Voodoo in Magic City analyzes anti-witchcraft discourses and practices among the Haitian Buddhist diaspora of Miami. Davines uh, argues that the multiple techniques deployed by the Haitian migrants uh, to conjure what they call the unfortunate and the unforeseen play a key role in the establishment of an anti-colonial posture that challenges the United States imperial agenda from within. Danes is also pursuing a graduate certificate in gender and sexuality studies and has served for the last two years as the president of the USC Africana Research Cluster. So before we begin, I want to emphasize that this presentation is being recorded and will be archived on our website for the public to watch and use as, as an educational resource. Attendees will be kept muted, but please feel free to write your questions uh, in the chat. Um, we will collect those questions um, and allow for a Q&A session before this presentation ends. Thank you. I'm gonna leave the space um, for uh, Mahalania here and Kahala Johnson. Be Teonauti and fly. Walking is for pathetic bipeds and swimming only half an option. Men see one horizon where you always see two. Perhaps that is why fishermen lost and unable to stomach any more of the sea feel fortunate to catch you so they may suck on your eyes. Fish out of water, fly. Fish out of water, see two horizons. Te Onauti by Teresia Te Aiva. Aloha mai kako, mai kamawana hohonu o namako o kaha'i ho, i ka papaku o hina lao lima kala. We begin this presentation by introducing ourselves. My name is Mahela Nyahia. I'm a diasporic born Kanako Oivi attending University of Hawaii at Manoa. And I maintain a tradition of oceanic crossings and connections built upon the adaptations of our ancestral journeys. Kahala Johnson is an on-island Hawaiian and diasporic Visayan who studies the pre-human ancestors of Kanaka Maoli within our cosmogonic chant, He Kumulipo. Today, We'll be talking about our article, A Breath of Ea, Deepening the Hawaiian Diaspora, where we seek to immerse an on-island, off-island, Kanaka Maoli kinship in a new relationship between indigeneity and what we name as diasporaneity, one that suspends the settler in order to discover submergent strategies of transmotion. We wrote A Breath of Ea, Deepening the Hawaiian Diaspora while living in my childhood hometown, located on the unceded lands of the Ahashiman Waneño Band of Indians in Southern California. Our publication calls attention to the ways that the Hawaiian diaspora and diaspora naity can be erased, made invisible, or obscured, counterintuitively by Hawaiian resistance to settler colonialism. Specifically, we gesture to how the antagonism in Hawaii between settlers and native on islanders can, when not attentive to the Hawaiian diaspora, end up drowning the ea, the sovereignty, breath, and self-determination of the latter through a settlement of Hawaiian indig indigeneity that privileges domestic, permanent resistance to colonization in our homeland. What do we mean by drowning the ea of the diaspora? The sovereignty of diasporic Hawaiians continues to be pulled under an antagonistic relationship circulating between ongoing settler invasions and native resistance to colonization in Hawaii. Metaphorically, we can think of this antagonistic relationship between settlers and natives in Hawaii as akin to the spiraling currents of a willy wai, 
a whirlpool vortex or maelstrom. As settlers invade and eliminate Hawaiian people to possess our lands, they build and establish structures that ensure our removal will remain permanent. In response, Hawaiians resist this elimination by refusing to move, by asserting our own kinships, and by raising nationalist movements for decolonization and liberation. Importantly, the refusal of Hawaiians to be subsumed by colonial eliminations prevents the antagonistic relationship from a resolving in favor of settlers. At the same time, when this refusal is produced only as a reaction to removal, it can unintentionally create difficulties for the Hawaiian diaspora. By privileging groundedness in the homeland as a standard for resistance to settler colonialism, on island Hawaiian responses to colonial invasion can end, up, can end up portraying the diaspora as a people and place where indigeneity fails to breathe or transpire, turning on island resistance to settler dislocation as the means of escaping a terrible di diasporic fate. Ironically, this fear can end up settling indigeneity itself by equating it with permanence in the homeland, thereby determining Hawaiian diasporaneity to be a benthic abyss of, of absence, alienation, forgetting, abandonment, lack, loss, and promiscuous movement, all of which must be avoided at all costs if decolonization is to prevail and the land retained. Speaking about this tension between Hawaiian indigeneity and diasporaneity, Dr. Lani Tavis writes in Define Indigeneity. My intention is to disrupt the perception that natives who do not live on their ancestral lands are somehow inauthentic, suffer from cultural loss, and do not have a place in the Lahui. To combat this perception, it is necessary to change our discussion of indigeneity as something always bounded by and to the land. Our genealogies and responsibilities to the land should be prioritized, but we should not lose sight of the diversity of experiences that exist within Hawaiian communities. We need to have a more robust conversation about how ideas of the native are constrained by discourses that privilege presence on the land in contrast to living in the diaspora and the impact these discourses have on belonging within our nations, our communities and ohanas. Ranging from economic dislocation to land struggles to the forms of exclusion that we internalize amongst ourselves, place-based forms of indigeneity tend to take precedence over indigenous histories of movement and travel. But like a fish caught in the spiraling currents of a maelstrom, Hawaiian diasporanity can be drawn, dragged, and drowned in the struggle between settlers and native on islanders. Nevertheless, we believe in and affirm the air of the Hawaiian diaspora. The diaspora has gills, the diaspora has fins. The diaspora breathes sovereignty in the salt water fathoms flowing beneath indigenous connections to land. And there in the depths of Oceania, our submerged ancestors wait, spiraling in the darkness where the settlement of Hawaiian indigeneity can be drowned. The darkness, the spiral, is the Po at the foundation of our cosmogonic chant, Hekumulipo. We turn to Hekumulipo to immerse ourselves in a different relationship between Hawaiian diasporaneity and indigeneity, one that suspends the settler in order to discover submergent strategies of transmotion from our pre-human ancestors within the chant. A new relationship might encourage us to sink deeper beneath the severed, connected, inside-outside, on-off-island relations transpiring between Hawaiian indigeneity and diasporaneity, so that we can finally breathe the dark ebb and flow of ea circulating below a settled surface. Hekumalipo is a ko'ihonua, a cosmogonic genealogy for the chief Kalani Nuya Mamao that was recorded and published by King David Kalakaua in the 19th century. This chant is divided into two parts, the Po, which describes the rise of pre-human ancestors from the sea and the night, and the Ao, which recounts the emergence of humanity and the genealogical succession of chiefs down to Kalani Nuya Mamao. He Kumulipo was composed to remind Kanaka Maoli rulers of their genealogical connectivity to our ancestors from the sea and from the night. We argue that a new relationship between Hawaiian diasporaneity and indigeneity can be traced to our cosmogeny genealogy chant He Kumulipo and to these submergent strategies and adaptations that our pre-human ancestors used to navigate the sea, land, and sky for millions of years. We therefore read Hekumulipo from a transgressive island feminism 
that interprets this chant as a diasporic cosmogony. We turn to two kinships within the chant, the plant nations of the Limu and La'au and the fish nations of the O'opukai and O'opuvai to explore submergent strategies for deepening the diaspora. We drift in the undertow of each of these kinships and submergent strategies as if they were ancestral whirlpools for further ponderings and contemplations by both off-island and diasporic Hawaiians. The limu kele gives birth, dwelling in the sea, protected by the kele plant, dwelling on land. The earliest ancestors mentioned in Hikumulipo are the algal nations that bloomed in the ocean and the vegetal nations that grew on the land. Our first set of submergent strategies come from these Limu and La'au ancestors, these algal and plant nations respectively, who collectively birthed umbilical connections between land and sea that were vital for generating interdependence and balance. These Limu and La'au elders composed and tended kinships with each other, creating the atmospheric oxygen required for all other life forms to emerge. We observe and interpret these kinships between algae and plants as transmotional relationships, owing to the movement of certain limu nations in the distant past from the sea onto the land. A nonlinear process involving multiple crossings, these algal ancestors eventually developed the critical adaptations necessary for terrestrial life roots, cellular walls, vascular systems, leaves, branches, spores, and seeds. In turn, these differentiations allow their descendants to form communities and ecologies that Kanaka Maoli, like ourselves, would later depend on for survival. Departing from settled perspectives of Hawaiian indigeneity, we submerge ourselves in a deeper desire for the transmotional diasporaneity embodied in the journeys of these pre-human nations from sea to land. By naming plants as the diasporic descendants of algal ancestors, we gesture toward diaspora Nadi as a basal precursor to Hawaiian identities. Tracing these memories of movement allows us to restore the kinships between on-island and off-island Hawaiians today in a way that empowers the relations between sea and land, limu and la'au, diaspora Nadi and indigeneity. With very few exceptions, the Limu and La'au bound together in relationship currently lack the adaptations needed to survive in each other's realm. For La'au living on land, this means a prohibition on returning to the sea, which renders their relation to their ancestors severed. Yet, despite their separation, La'au descendants are still connected to their Limu ancestors through the submergent strategies of survival that they continue to practice on land. The first of these is fragmentation, an asexual strategy of reproduction that is also pr practiced by coral in the sea and kalo on land. Fragmentation allows many limu and la'au the ability to reproduce themselves when severed, their fragments growing into entirely new bodies and communities capable of proliferating in abundance. And for this, we see fragmentation not as a necessarily only a disadvantage or a feeling of being cut off, but actually as a way our ancestors use severance and disconnection um, as a means of growing their communities. Another submergent strategy Limu and La'al also practice is metagenesis or the alternation of generations, which allows them to change body forms for the purpose of growing their nations. Assisting metagenesis in these adaptations is the fact that a majority of Limu and La'al share intersexual, bisexual, asexual, and mahu qualities, which allow them to thrive in adaptable ways in the sea and on the land. And metagenesis is a way for us to explore in the article and ask questions about how queered and mahu um, pre-human ancestors can help queered and mahu <laughs> trans intersex uh, uh, diaspora communities today. Um, find, um, find influences, uh, inspirations for the diaspora Navy. And the last emergent strategy um, that we present for these nations is photosynthesis, um, which allows Limu and La'au to respire and produce food from sunlight. The ability to photosynthesize is based on an earlier endosymbiotic relationship formed by the ancestors of Limu and La'au, a eukaryotic cell which assimilated a cyanobacterium in the ocean. The latter became a chloroplast resides and resides in the former's body, granting them the ability to photosynthesize and produce air or oxygen, a trait which is passed on to later Limu and La'au descendants. La'au today continue to maintain this trait despite their ancestors having migrated to a vastly different terrestrial locale. 
The connection to each other via photosynthesis is an inherited characteristic, even though most limu cannot survive the land and most la'al cannot survive the sea. And it is this photosynthesis and this ability to create a circulating air, um, which allows us to think of diasporanity as having its own air in addition um, and producing its own air in addition to being in relationship to um, on islander um, air. Hanao ka opu kai noho i kai, kia i ia e ka opu vai noho i uka. Born is the oopu kai who dwells in the sea, protected by the oopu vai who dwell on the land. In the Kumulipo second wa, the fish nations are born in the currents of the sea, paired with la'au plant nations on land, including the oopu kai and the oopu vai. Kai meaning sea, vai meaning fresh water. These are names given for various fish, gobies, blennies, puffers, and types of taro in a kuleana kinship with each other. As part of their amphibomous life cycle, O'opu live the majority of their life in freshwater streams, pools, and estuaries, with species being found in various elevations on the islands from the mulivai to the waterfall founts. Adults will reproduce in streams and pools when they sense an increase in storm surges and floods, depositing their eggs wherever they can on rocky substrates that either develop into larvae or are washed down to the sea. Oopu and the kai grow into juveniles and develop the strength to return to the vai, where they will metamorphize and travel upstream to eventually repeat the entire process. This amphibomous transmotion is an adaptation and submergent strategy allowing O'opu to traverse the vai and the kai. Expulsion out to sea allows O'opu to disperse themselves beyond their original birthplace. This increases their range and habitat. And importantly, O'opu do not return to the spawning grounds of their parents, seeking instead new freshwater environments to live and reproduce. This behavior renders them moku from their home waters, and it is an adaptation to seasonal changes and river flows that might make a return more perilous to their survival. O'opu amphidromi thus emphasizes the centrality of motion and dispersal, as well as that of cyclical returns that move away from their streams of origin. Indeed, what is returned to in each successive generation is not a birthplace or a home water, but the vai, the kai, and the movement between them. Amphibomous transmotion is a submergent strategy. This generates a tidalectic between fresh and salt waters, as well as a kuleana kinship that draws Kanaka and Kalo into the cycle. Oopu often select Lo'i Kalo, or taro plantations, tended by Kanaka as places to live and spawn. These patches offer shelter and food as Oopu clean the Kalo of parasites and rot. In turn, Oopu and Kalo are raised by Kanaka for food. At the same time, the O'opu would be declared periodically kapu or protected from consumption so that their nations could rebuild and increase. Claiming the journey of O'opu between the Vai and Kai as diasporic renders their relationship with Kanaka and Kalo a collaboration with diasporic nations. Recalling this memory of transmotion potentially transforms how we view Kanaka culture and its connection to Kalo by emphasizing the role that an amphibious nation like the O'opu play in tending to both of their descendants. This next submergent strategy involving the O'opu includes an amazing adaptation of their pelvic fins. During their development in the Kai, some O'opu nations transform to possess an opiko or a suction cup on their lower midsection, which is developed from the fusion of their pelvic fins. The opiko allows these oopu to climb cliffs and waterfalls to higher and more pristine freshwater streams and pools. Interestingly, the opiko provides the oopu with a direct physiological attachment to the aina substrate that can be interpreted in a similar manner to how Kanaka perceive our own pico as umbilical connections to land. When they're transformed to provide attachment to Aina, this connection functions to increase the movement and dispersal of O'opu on their journey upstream. And furthermore, unlike the pico of Kanaka that ties us to our birthplace or our origins, the opiko of O'opu connects them to an amphibomous cycle and a birthing of new origins. The opiko then connects to Aina for the purpose of creating generational umbilical spirals back and forth in a tidalectic between Vai and Kai.
In order for this travel between Vai and Kai, O'opu must develop the capacity to regulate their internal bodies in relation with external water around them. In the Vai, O'opu are threatened with salt loss and hyperhydration. And in the Kai, the situation is reversed. An excess of salt and a lack of fresh water can damage their tissues. Osma regulatory mechanisms in the O'opu gills and kidneys work to resolve this dilemma by balancing the salt and water to ratios in the fish in their environment. These adaptations continue to allow the O'opu to cross water boundaries and to process levels of salinity as they move, engaging their breath and air in multiple environments. As we ponder the O'opu nations, how might notions of diasporic um, return be resought using the infrigimous life cycle of O'opu who returned to Wai and Kai, but not to the original home waters? Oh, okay. <laughs> and I think that is where we are concluding. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Mahalo. Presentation. Uh, then we have maybe uh, the space now for Aria. Sure. Let me just, oh, thank you very much, Mahala and Ka. Uh, Mahia and Kahala, this was an amazing presentation, very interesting one. So I also have a PowerPoint uh, for you. Unfortunately, it's much less. I don't have your talent, and you know it's just it's very austere. But uh, I got maps. Okay, so I think we're good. Okay, and speaking of maps, uh, yeah, thank you very much to uh, to Marina Caridas and Norley Rodriguez Cross for organizing this series of talk in the Island Feminisms project. And also for carrying on this project for so long, uh, considering the very special moment we are, you know, passing through, living in, uh, it's a moment of crisis for difficulties and crisis for many minorities, minorities in general, and for academia as a whole. So, you know, thank you very much for keeping like this project, you know, afloat. Uh, yeah, I think it deserves our praise and admiration. So thanks both to you for that. Okay, so today we're going to talk about queerness and we're going to talk about queerness, insularity and diasporic belonging in the French Caribbean. So to give you a little bit like of context, uh, I started this project almost 10 years ago in 2012. All right, back then I was an MA student in anthropology in Paris. And I was writing my MA thesis about French LGBTQ French Caribbean people living in France, in Paris region. I did, I conducted an ethnographic fieldwork, did participant observations, conducted interviews. And what I maybe remember the most from this moment, like from this ethnographic fieldwork, when was when I asked LGBTQ. Caribbean, French Caribbean activists, like, okay, tell me more about life on the island. How it is how it is to be a queer person in Guadeloupe, in Martinique? How do we live as a queer person on the Caribbean island? And what those people told me was, well, Aurelian, it's hard. And, you know, it's violent. And there will be murder and suicide, hypocrisy, bigotry, sexual misery, self-hatred, parochialism, forced marriage, despair and so on and so forth. So back then, 2012, 2013, I thought like, wow, Guadeloupe must be hell for you know, queer people. And then when I started my PhD program at USC in 2017, I got the opportunity to conduct a field work in Guadeloupe on the island itself. And then to much of my surprise, I discovered that there is actually a vibrant queer life in Guadeloupe, a vibrant queer life with queer Guadeloupean people who have either choose to stay on the island and or who spend a few years, a few months in Paris, in France, in Europe, and then decided to move back to Guadeloupe. So I was like, huh, that's interesting. And I was, you know, interested to know this encounters, interviews encouraged me to think about the relationship between Caribbean migration, African diaspora, and queerness in the French Caribbean context. So the argument I'm developing with you today takes its source from this initial reflection, and I will review with you two topics I identify as critical or crucial when it comes to understand the life and imaginary of queer Guadeloupean people, which are insularity and the act 
or the practice of insularizing, the process of insularizing the continent and the metropolitan continent. And second, what I call opaque queerness. So we spend about seven to eight minutes on each topic, uh, mostly discussing my ethnographic data. And then I will conclude with some broader reflection on the institutional future of Guadeloupe, AKA independence. Yeah, we need to talk about that at some point. So as I've said, yes, maps. Uh, yeah, I don't expect you to know a lot about Guadeloupe. So here it is. Guadeloupe is located uh, in the Caribbean region in a subregion called the Lesser Antilles. Here you can see Guadeloupe and its sister island Martinique. Both are a part of France and French territory. Oopsie, sorry about that. Oula. There we go. So Guadeloupe is actually composed of many different small islands, two main islands and small and a few smaller islands. It's pretty much the size of Oahu. In, uh, in Hawaii. Uh, in terms of demographics, so I had this discussion with Marina uh, Carides a few months ago, a few months back, but French law bans the collection of race based data. So we don't know exactly uh, the racial composition of Guadeloupe. So I give as an estimate, a very rough estimate, 85% of Guadeloupeans are black and are mixed race. It can be more, it can be less. I'm not exactly sure. This is a rough estimate, uh, but it's better than nothing. And overwhelmingly, where do people are black and are mixed race? Um, it's under French rule since 1635, and it became a French département, which is the equivalent of a US state in 1946. Guadeloupe is part of the European Union, it's considered as a European territory, and the euro is the official currency in used, uh, used in Guadeloupe. So, Okay, so that is Guadeloupe, but Guadeloupe is not, Guadeloupean people not only live on the island, they also live in the diaspora. It is estimated today uh, that at least 25% of native Guadeloupeans, of people who were born in Guadeloupe on the island, 25% now live in metropolitan France, in a region that we call, I mean, that, not that we call, that is officially named, called Ile-de-France, which can be translated as island of France as you can see here on the map. That's where Paris is located. Paris and also like the center of France in terms of population and uh, economic activity. As you maybe have heard about it, but same-sex marriage was legalized in 2013 by uh, the French parliament in Paris. And it's important or interesting to note that three out of the four Guadeloupean representatives and senators sitting in the parliament abstain from voting or voted against the legalization of same-sex marriage in 2013. And to justify their opposition to same-sex marriage, most represent, I mean, at least three of the four representatives invoked reservations due to cultural differences. And the fact that homosexuality is a foreign and European practice that does not exist among the Caribbean population. So, of course, queerness and non-normative, not heteronormative behaviors and homosexuality cannot and do not exist in the Caribbean. So, as you can imagine, um, homophobia is a real issue in Guadeloupe, not only in Guadeloupe, of course, but it's also true in Guadeloupe. And so many activists have tried to find a solution. I've tried to find a solution to how to do, how do we do with homophobia, how do we deal with that uh, in, in Guadeloupe. And for instance, the main uh, LGBTQ French Caribbean uh, organization that is based in Paris, in the island of France, in Ile de France, for instance, consider that the main and best strategy to fight against homophobia in Guadeloupe was to um, turn, in a certain way, uh, Guadeloupean, queer Guadeloupean people into proud and not activists, okay? So in other words, to try to emancipate, to liberate Kurgan people by helping them to fit within a certain model, a certain political agenda, or a certain sexual politics, and a certain way of being an activist. So 10 years later, because I, you know, I'm working on that project for a long time, 10 years later, nothing much has changed in Guadeloupe, and the strategy has proved to be not very effective. So I interviewed dozens of queer Guadeloupean people in Guadeloupe and in France. 
And what I got from those interviews is that I contend that queer Guadeloupean people have developed their own creative take on queerness and blackness, the take that refuses and challenges the West definition of identity as a bonded, transparent, and white-centric ego or entity. In fact, Guadeloupean queerness approaches same-sex desire as a practice and as the effect of a reading intimately related to insularity, the insular life, life on the island, and to opacity. Through these practices and readings, queer Guadeloupean people contribute to insularize the continent and to subvert French imperialism from within. So let's take a look at that. Uh, so this is a picture I actually uh, took in 2012 at the Paris Pride, long time ago. So as you know, historically, during the modern era, what we know call the modern era, the development by the West of an ontological apparatus promoting the ideals of affiliation, legitimacy, and genesis as a way to fix identities and to ban the possibilities of exchange in the colony, in the plantation, has imposed evolution as a single available narrative for Caribbean people to think themselves. Of course, in this narrative, Caribbean people and French Caribbean people particularly are stuck, they don't have an identity. They are not yet French and not quite French at the same time. As famously discussed by Franz Fanon, but also by Edouard Glissant, this feeling of being not yet European or not yet American and not quite European, not quite American, not quite African, not yet Black, et cetera, et cetera, has been deeply ingrained in the post-colonial Caribbean context and Caribbean people often see little alternatives but to perceive their identity as singularly constituted by the, last, by the lack of a lost object, an identity, a legitimate identity, a current identity. And this identity would exist somewhere on the other side of the Atlantic. Therefore, the metropole, France in this case, the metropole appears as the ideal place where such whole and legitimate identity might be eventually reclaimed. Moving from the Caribbean island to the island of France, is sometimes perceived as a way to be acknowledged as a French person, but also as a way to reclaim an identity and a personhood. It's also true for queer Guadeloupean people, of course. However, for queer Guadeloupean people, the metropole also represents something a little bit different. It represents, at least for people who contributed to the study, Paris specifically represents the site of freedom, self-realization, and sexual fulfillment. Paris is a city of light, and the paradise, the heaven of an accepting and vibrant queer scene. This narrative, of course, of the queer metropolis uh, is not foreign from a neo-colonial, more broader neo-colonial discourse and neo-colonial strategies that consistently describes the island and the small island of Guadeloupe as the anti-metropole, as an homophobic place, but also as an enclosed, parochial, bigot, poor, and lacking any political or economic perspectives. This dialectic between the queer metropole and the homophobic island doesn't give queer Guadeloupean people much choice. After all, they have to choose their side of the Atlantic. And in fact, queer Guadeloupean people do regularly move from Guadeloupe or Martinique to the metropole in order to experience this European, white, and actually pretty tempting queer life. From an external standpoint, we could believe that crossing the Atlantic to reclaim a European and white marked queerness may appear as nothing less than a desire to expose the metropolitan imperial ideal. And yes, as demonstrated in the article published in Shima this month, uh, queer Guadeloupean people, when they come to Paris region, they actively, they actively invest in Paris region and they not only inhabit it, but also they connect in Paris region with other members of the African diaspora. So I described the whole story of a man, um, 30 year old, gay Guadeloupean man, black man named Julien, who actually moved to Paris. And there he connected with and befriended and had sex with men from West Africa, migrants from the former French colonies located in West Africa. I suggest that queer Guadeloupean and Martinican migrants to Paris region contribute to insularize the post-colonial metropole and to turn Paris into a third island besides Guadeloupe and Martinique. 
And I want to insist here on insularization as a process, as an open-ended gesture towards a constant creolization and hybridization of the metropolitan space and the subversion, the subversion of the metropolitan space. I believe that this concept of insularization of the continental metropole can positively contribute to understand queer Guadeloupean people not as oppressed and alienated sexual migrants, but rather as creative, creative and active sexual migrants as moving subjects, but also as moved subjects who are transformed along the route as much as they remodel the space they traverse. Rather than a form of alienation then, the crossing to the queer metropolis from the Caribbean homophobic parochial awful island to the liberated emancipated Parisian island is rather a movement essential to subjective, rather than an alienation, is a movement essential to subjective and collective formation, and I believe is able to trigger political changes and emancipatory imaginaries. Of course, moving from the Caribbean island to the metropolitan island contribute to challenge the fiction of a whole white and coherent queer or gay identity. And I want in the second part here of this presentation to focus in more depth on how queerness is understood through and thanks to this transatlantic crossing and on the island itself. So as recalled by Queer of Color scholars, I'm thinking in particular of Natasha Tinsley or Jeffrey Allen, the concepts of queer and queerness are often insufficient to adequately describe non-normative sexual and gender behavior in the Caribbean, okay? Many ethnographies relate or describe how homosexuality in the Caribbean is often acknowledged but rarely defined. It is known, everyone know, but no one wanna talk about it. In some sense, sex desire is believed to exist, but only as a practice and not as a social identity and let alone as a political item. In Guadeloupe, homosexuality is first and foremost a doing and not a being. So in the article, in my article, I take the example of a woman that I call Evelyn, uh, that I met in the capital city of Pointe-à-Pitre in Guadeloupe. And Evelyn had been badly injured in the head during a fight, a bar fight with another woman because, and I quote Evelyn here, because this woman wanted to make lesbian with me. So, you know, in standard French, the correct formulation would be like, oh, a lesbian tried to have sex with me, or I met a lesbian woman. No, for Evelyn, the name lesbian is a verb. Lesbian is a verb. And for her, it is absolutely obvious that lesbian is something you do and not something you are or someone you are. And this is why you believe queerness in Guadeloupe is usually not noticed by external observers. External observers will quickly jump to the conclusion that there is no queer people in Guadeloupe, that it doesn't exist anyway, and that it could not exist. It's not that it doesn't exist. It is just, it's just that it exists under the threshold of perceptibility, of Western white perceptibility because it does not fully use the Western grammar of identity, inner truth, and self-knowledge. The opacity of Guadeloupean queerness alters, alters the white Western reading of the Caribbean queer body by insisting on same-sex desire as a hermeneutical excess, which means as a result of a reading. Queerness in Guadeloupe is a result of a reading, and it's always an ambiguous and impure interpretation. So of course, the US concepts of homosexuality, gay, lesbian, queer, do not do justice to the specificities and the creativity of the act of same sex desiring on the Guadeloupean island. So that's why uh, in my article, I've come the term pedi, or pedi, as you can see here written on the PowerPoint, as an alternative concept that seeks to accurately translate the specificity of insular queerness, Guadeloupean insular queerness. The concept of the PD can be understood in at least three distinct ways. The PDI can be read in French means little is said or little is conveyed linguistically. When you hear it, not read it, when you hear it, the PDI means to have the power to say, to peux dire, I have the power to say, I can say, I can talk. And the acronym of the PUDI is heard and read like the quintessential French homophobic slur, PD, that can roughly be roughly translated as fag or queer. So the contingency and vibrancy of the circulation of same-sex desire in Guadeloupe offer new perspectives to challenge the aporias of the canonical invisibility, visibility dialectic, you know, the closet, out of the closet, within the closet, 
that has been consistently invoked to describe the insular and Caribbean practices, uh, non-heteronormative practices. And this is also where the concept of opacity that I borrow from Edouard Glissant becomes critical. Opacity, according to Glissant, encourages us to alter the reading of racial and cultural difference and to challenge the rational epistemic of the Enlightenment and you know, its obsession with geographical mapping, transparency, exploration, clearness, et cetera, et cetera. Instead of approaching the PD as an example of self-loathing, dissimulation, secrecy, hypocrisy, I suggest to approach rather the PD as an opaque practice of retelling of the Caribbean self that is actualized through impure interpretation and precarious hybridization. In other words, I suggest that the opacity of same-sex desire in Guadeloupe challenges the metropolitan and colonial dominant reading of the Black queer body as primarily victim of the Black insular mentality, and thus condemned to invisibility, exile, and suffering. As explained earlier, queerness in Guadeloupe can never be saved. It can only be read. It can only be interpreted. Insularity produces a reading that contests colonial and Western categories, and that offers new ways of being queer and to queer the island. Voila. In a nutshell, voila. I want to conclude now with just something a little bit more you know, in the moment, like right now what's going on in, in Guadeloupe. So uh, I don't know if you have heard about that. Uh, about that, but in November, between November 2021 and January 2022, it's very recent. Uh, Guadeloupe and its sister island Martinique have seen a series of protests against COVID-19 restrictions and mandatory vaccination rules for health workers. And ultimately, these protests have grown into a call to address long-standing issues on the islands, such as social and racial inequalities, but also high prices, prices, and this latent feeling of being abandoned by the metropole, this frustration, lack of work opportunity and lack of future, especially for the youth. So protesters, as you can see on this picture, in, taken in Saint Rose in, in January 2022 in Guadeloupe, protesters have set fire to rubbish bins, tires, they built roadways and looted shops, and we also saw gunmen shooting at police and firefighters. Uh, the situation was pretty tense, uh, but eventually calmed down after the French government has opened the door for negotiating the autonomy of these overseas territories. But autonomy doesn't mean independence, right? And actually, the protests have revived this long-standing discussion regarding the formal independence and decolonization of Guadeloupe and Martinique, actually. Historically, pro-independence movements have been quite powerful in Guadeloupe because I'm thinking of like protesting uh, the protest of February 1952 or May 1967 that were bloodily repressed by the French police. And so there is a strong tradition of pro-independence movements and pro-independence activism in Guadeloupe, uh, usually from you know, conceiving decolonization and independence from a Marxist or materialist perspective. But, you know, what was made sense in the 70s is maybe a little bit more appealing to the youngest generation in 2022. Um, and actually, I interviewed a woman, 35-year-old Barbara. She's, she's a young bisexual woman from Pointe-à-Pitre. And I asked her about what do you think about the independence of that group? I asked her in 2019. And she replied, I quote, the independence of Guadeloupe, but what for? The independence movements are corrupted. They do nothing. They are interested in securing funds and Congress positions. We are French and yet will never be. It is how it is, unquote. Barbara, as many people I met in Guadeloupe, among the diaspora and on the island, feels that they've missed the decolonization moment of the 60s and 70s. And independence do not, does not seem to be a realistic option right now in 2022. Actually, the Guadeloupe and independence movements uh, scored 5% of the votes, uh, gathered 5% of the votes at the last uh, latest local elections. And in reality, the political party that is currently getting an increasing support among the Guadeloupean population is no one else but the Rassemblement National, an extreme right nationalist and neo fascist French party currently chaired by Marine Le Pen. And in spite of its extremely xenophobic positions, the RN, 
and Marine Le Pen are getting more and more popular every year, and they get big, better scores in Guadeloupe than in Metropole itself, than in France itself. So there are many reasons, and I explain why a neo-fascist party is scoring so good and so well in Guadeloupe. But I think one of the main, not the main reason, but one of the reasons is probably the lack of a credible perspective for decolonization right now, and the promises of decolonization and independence that has not been fulfilled by the left. So therefore, and that will be like my last question and definite, definitive conclusion, shall we definitely abandon the idea of a formal decolonization of Guadeloupe? That's a real question. Well, I suggest with this project, with this article, that the very life of queer Guadeloupean people invite us to rethink how we define and expect from the concept of freedom, emancipation, and decolonization in an insular context, in the Caribbean context. The people I met and had the honor to work with have created alternative ways to deal with and to subvert from within the metropole. They know more than anyone else that the narrative celebrating an authentic blackness, a true Caribbeanness, um, white queerness or European gayness are just harmful political fictions. Rather than seeking to erase friends from Guadeloupe or to renounce to their affiliation and affection for Caribbean culture. Queer Guadeloupean people prefer to embrace a diasporic and Creole understanding of their identity using movement migration to build bridges with the rest of the African diaspora and the rest of the Caribbean region. Rather than claiming Guadeloupe as a formally independent island, they seek to transform the continental metropole into a post-colonial island. It is not Guadeloupe that remains French, but France that is becoming Caribbean. And queer Guadeloupean people, because of their unique social and political position, embrace this desire for authority that is fueled by an identity, a diasporic identity, always on the move. And that concludes this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. And yeah, and I'm excited to talk about it and hear your question and feedback. Thank you. Mahalo, gracias. Thank you so much to our presenters for this. Um, presentations. Um, if it's okay, uh, Ariel, can we uh, stop sharing the, the, the screen so that we can see everybody and um, allow our attendees to ask questions? We can write the questions on the chat, um, but also uh, feel free to um, jump in and ask a question. I, I can start us off. Um, I, um, I guess I'd like you, if it's possible for each each group to um, speak um, to the other paper uh, in terms of a dialogue, because it's one of the things I see is, um, you know, we're talking about diaspora, but we're we're speaking about um, specific kinds of diaspora and they're sort of unique. Um, relationships, whether it's based in queerness or indigeneity. And um, I, I wonder, I guess, if, if there's elements of diaspora and, and being on islands that are, are distinct and may be present in, in both your analyses, um, or if there are certain qualities um, that, you know, that overlap with diasporas in, in general as well, I guess, but maybe just more, um, yeah, in speaking to each other's uh, uh, works, I think might be interesting if you're up for it. Thank you. <laughs> I can start. One of the things that initially struck me uh, about queer diaspora Nadi is that a lot of our Kanaka Maoli leave Hawaii and, um, and seek out sort of safer refuge to be queer in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, up and down the Western coast, as well as, um, as Vegas. And so it, it often is a safer place to come into your own than within your own Ohana, which is sad to me, but is a reality. Do you wanna to add to that, Kahala? Yeah, um, my uh, Mahu Kupuna, my, um, 
non-binary, trans, intersex, queer, <laughs> but more than that, um, and uh, elder, um, that was true for them. They had to um, leave their family lands um, to go to the diaspora because at that period in time and still today, um, you know, there was this relationship between queerness and indigeneity, which I guess was irreconcilable because of colonization and Christianity in particular. Um, well, what was interesting, though, was the relationship between queerness and Blackness, queerness and Latinxness, um, queerness and Native Americanness, um, and the and queerness and diaspora Native. And so, um, coming back um, when they began to teach me about their experiences there, um, they transmitted that knowledge and Ike, which did not come from my Hawaiian communities. It actually came from communities here in the continent. Um, and it was through that knowledge um, that we were able to create um, spaces on Haleaka, uh, excuse me, spaces on Mauna Kea, specifically for Mahu and LGBTQ identifying um, folks. And so um, I see this, you know, a lot of times for, for my personal life, um, finding indigeneity and queerness, yeah, there's still that tension and whatnot. And, you know, sometimes I'm just like, I'm done with both y'all. <laughs> um, but what's really fascinating for me is the ways that um, both queerness and indigeneity and diaspora have allowed me um, through the experiences of my elders to um, get off the on-island centricity that oftentimes plagues a lot of our um, indigenous movements for good reason, like we said, um, you know, there's ongoing erasure of us, but it also allowed me to like, explore my Visayan. Um, and that's, to me, that's that's another aspect of queer, is like um, moving away from even the normative, I guess, within indigeneity and in Hawaiian Maoliness um, and towards other ancestries and other connections, um, which allow, you know, I, I think that's a really important part of um, that, that diaspora flow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mahalo. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, sorry. No, yeah, no, if I can add to that, I mean, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I, I've been actually, okay, I, I've been fascinated by, in your presentation, in your in your work, both of you, how are you using uh, in a very, I was about to say in a beautiful, but actually in a very poetic manner, uh, indigenous epistemologies to explore this idea of point of origin and the ability to create new points of origin, the ability to consider indigeneity not as stuck somewhere, but rather as something that is constantly evolving, creating, moving forward, uh, and actually trying to resolve um, the difficulties of, you know, the diasporic, the diasporic existence that is unfortunately not an option, always an option for some uh, LGBTQ queer people. Um, so what I think in terms of commonalities, I do think that, I mean, in, in the case of queer Guadeloupean people, there is this very strong, very strong attachment to always constantly creating new ways of being in the world and new ways of connecting with all their diasporas. Uh, remember that because of the colonial situation context, Guadeloupe is very much isolated from the rest of the Caribbean. Um, and there is not much point of contact with all their communities like Jamaica or Cuba or even Haiti to a certain extent. So they do constantly use the diaspora as something that is evolving, expanding almost in a very biological, organic way. Uh, no, uh, I also think, I mean, from Okay, so my work is much more affiliated to an African diasporic tradition and a Caribbean theoretical tradition. So I tend to usually take my distance from, um, you know, the concept of authenticity, um, true, true, yeah, truth, authenticity, origin, genesis. Um, and also I try to always get like, I'm very wary of the concept of identity in general. Uh, and people in Guadeloupe do not really like to define themselves according to certain labels, and they prefer describing themselves by what they're doing uh, and with whom. Uh, but yeah, I would be interested in knowing maybe more what, maybe the concept of identity makes much more sense in an indigenous context. Um, and I think it does maybe. So I would be interested in knowing your opinion about, you know, yeah, identity, authenticity, 
What, what do you do with this concept? Yeah, um, you know, that that is one of the uh, central problems that we do take up. Um, it's kind of the uh, genesis of the paper, but uh, in terms of like identity and authenticity, it's so weird for me because I'm the All Islander, I don't know. But um, the one of the, okay, as part of the problem, <laughs> um, on Islander um, engagements, like we said, with um, the settler colonial drive to eliminate us has created this kind of whirlpool we call um, uh, a back and forth, which does something to identity, right? Um, which takes what indigeneity, Maliness, kind of Hawaiian-ness, um, which moved, you know, like we moved, um, we keep moving. Um, um, and we didn't stop moving. Um, you know, it, it takes that and it necessitates this kind of like freeze. It's like a, a needing to stand still. I mean, I also and I I, I also want to just point out here that I also don't want to pose like like you know movement also is just always liberating because there's like an ableism there and whatnot, right? Um, but what I want to point out too though is in this problem um, created by this dialectic between on islanders and settlers, um, the diaspora is affected, right? Um, and um, what what happens in this relationship is that it, the diaspora gets sacrificed, the diaspora gets stigmatized against, um, as seen as inauthentic, um, because a way and only imagined as a place of like you know failure and and, and identity loss, and so um, what we tried to do and what we were trying to do in terms of like um, relationships was to switch the relationship. Um, instead of having a constant battle between native and settlers, which of course is ongoing, um, we tried to find ways to turn the indigenous and diasporic into another relationship. One which doesn't necessitate the elimination of the other, um, but one which actually, when we dig deeper, like one of the phrases we use is dig digging deeper below indigeneity, below the on islandness, we actually find the ocean, right? Or we find um, uh, movement, we find, um, which means that indigeneity is, has movement, right? Um, and it gets that through the diasporaneity of our ancestors. And so by putting these into, um, into a relationship with each other, we move away from identity. Um, even though identity is important, um, we begin to circulate a different a relationship and a, a accountability to each other. Um, that's not romantic. It's still painful, right? Going that's back okay. to our ancestors and exploring that isn't going to erase all the, the, the issues. Um, but it does provide us a different space from which to think about um, ways to end colonialism that doesn't also end the diaspora. So. Yeah, we think often about kuleana, which is our word for responsibilities, reciprocity, accountability, rights and privileges, and in the relationality um, in this kuleana between each other. Um, so we might ask questions like with your presentation, I heard you say that um, in the end, um, that the metropole was actually becoming, taking on qualities of the Caribbean, right? So there is kind of a, a back and forth, it's a give and take, it's not unidirectional. And so there is a possibility for transformation in those ways. Um, and so we ask each other, well, what is our kuleana, um, mine as a diaspora to on island and Kahala's as an on island to diaspora? How do we move in a different way and think differently and transform our relationship and our responsibilities to each other? Um, and that, that to me is where liberation comes in, where we get to restore our AF rather than um, diaspora being an identity that um, is, you know, just like indigeneity is always at risk of being erased by colonialism, rather than always centering the colonial, we can sort of set the settler aside for a little bit and figure out what our relationship to each other is. Thank you very much. I want to mention briefly that um, some uh, connections that I'm seeing also with my reality that I know best, which is Puerto Rico, and now living in the diaspora myself, um, uh, reminds me uh, a bit of these tensions uh, that uh, have been happening uh, during big processes of immigration from Puerto Rico to the United States. And um, now, more recently, after Hurricane Maria, um, many people, right, thousands of people of Puerto Ricans leaving uh, the island of Puerto Rico, as well as other immigrants that uh, resides in the island, 
And um, thinking about this tension that was built after that of those that stay and this, uh, this course about I stay and you left, like you left us building the country, right? Building, rebuilding everything. And those that uh, uh, are talking about, I'm just out of this. I'm not gonna be part of this uh, by uh, actually uh, saying, uh, yo me quito, which is uh, I step back, like I, I'm not going to be part of that. And the yo no me quito, which is the, the ones that I'm going to stay and I will reveal, right? Um, and it's a very interesting um, tension because uh, during, after the hurricane, there was this uh, lack of aid, right? That, and also the militarization of relief. Um, but uh, it was from Puerto Ricans in the diaspora that was actually sending <laughs> um, aid to communities uh, in different creative ways that they figure out how to get there and 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 work with communities to to get aid to certain uh, people right to, to the people um, and also and and so that tension right that tension about being in the land or leaving. Um, and, 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 and the, the sense of responsibility when in fact we actually travel also with, with that sense of, of being part of the island, right? It's, it's a very interesting, the way you put it is different. It's, it's, it's completely, right? I'm trying to make sense of how to, how to put those in conversation. And then Ariel, uh, your work reminds me a lot of, uh, 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 the, the work of um, uh, Lawrence LaFountain. Uh, he, he talks about uh, queer Ricans and, uh, and queer Ricans, um, this, this form of sexile, what he calls the sexile, which is almost like this forced exile uh, from Puerto Ricans in the island to the United States in order to, right? In the same way for uh, indigenous, uh, queer indigenous people in Hawaii to, to have this uh, place where they can be, right? Um, so I find uh, these conversations on islands and movement very interesting and, and, and identity, right? I think in a way we all uh, can uh, identify uh, with these stories as well. Any last comments or, or questions before we close it up? Um, I would like to add an extension of what Noralis just said, um, because I have lived uh, twice the length of time that Noralis has lived. So <laughs> I can think a little bit about stages. And I remember when there was this very intense hostility in the island against those that left, and especially those that lost their language, who couldn't speak fluently. And so I've been struck by the fact that Mahe and Kahala have put an emphasis on language use in your presentation. But I'm talking about a much recent stage that I think adds some hope to this discussion is a development that I've seen in Puerto Rico where the people uh, some people in Puerto Rico who are uh, who so are those that stayed, right? They didn't leave, are also saying something along the lines of, if we do not put our emphasis on independence, but put an emphasis on developing the kind of world and island and that we want, then we don't have to rely on the idea of nation, but the idea of how do we live. And so I'm thinking that both of your presentations in some ways point to a version of that that I have also heard in Puerto Rico. Thank you for excellent and thought provoking presentations. Thank you, Angela. Very nice. Thank you very much. Well, I think we're past five. Uh, if there are no many questions anymore, um, uh, Yes, I, I just keep seeing comments on the chat. So I'm just gonna say that maybe we're ready to end the presentation and hopefully we will come in the future with more presentations to uh, continue the conversation on islands and feminism. Thank you for being here today. Mahalo.
Gracias.